My name is Sarah Richardson, a participant in the Project Next Generation program at Carbondale Public Library. Today is November 2nd, 2016, and I will be interviewing Illinois veteran Tina Griffiths at the Carbondale Public Library in Carbondale, Illinois. Jennifer Johansson will also be assisting in this interview. This interview is being conducted for the Illinois Veterans History Project. So when and where were you born? I was actually born in Marion, Illinois on October 12th, 1985. Oh, my birthday's October 3rd, so that's cool. Oh. Yeah. Are Sorry. you a Libra too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, what was your favorite subject and hobby in school? English and creative writing. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I had Mrs. Carondo in high school and she was a huge inspiration. Do you still write now? I do. Yep. Um, actually, while I was deployed, I kept a journal, and I mailed them home to Mrs. Crondo, and she read them while I was gone. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I love creative writing stuff. So. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your parents, and do you have any siblings? Um, my dad is William Griffith Sr. He's 83 years old. He lives in Willisville, Illinois. My mom is Deborah Darlene Wright. Uh, she currently lives in St. Charles, Missouri. I have seven siblings, all or half. I have two brothers and five sisters. Um, I could tell you all the names, but I'm sure I'll forget one and they'll be mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So uh, I think you said you had a lot of family that served in the military, did you? Or yep. Yeah. Um, my dad is a Korean vet. Um, my grandpa is a World War II vet. My brother Doug is a Air Force veteran. He was in for 10 years and now he lives up by Scott Air Force Base. Uh, a couple of my nephews were in the Army. I think a couple of my sisters did some time in the Army National Guard as well. Cool. Um, did that, like a lot of people in your family, did that influence your decision to be in the military? You would think so, but no, not really. Um, my dad only spoke about his service once. Uh, my grandpa, the only thing I knew about him was that he had lost his hand in the war. Um, but nobody really talked about their military service. Okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was in high school. I was being rude, I'm sure, and I made really good grades, and I just hung out with my friends a lot, and I don't know, we were just bored one day, and the recruiters were at our school, and, you know, we just said, you know, what if we join? What if we went right now? And uh, so I approached the recruiter, and I said, if I can go to basic training this summer, I'll join, but if not, I'm not going. <laughs> so... Oh. They made it happen, and I left that summer, so. Did you feel any, like, nervousness since you were so young, you know? Or? No, I think I was just too young to care at the time. Um, I knew that it would pay for college. I knew that my grandparents couldn't afford to pay for my college. I knew that I wanted to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that's where I wanted to be. So it just seemed like a good decision for me. Oh, cool. And it paid for your college? It did. So did you go to basic training before you finished high school or right after high school? I went in between my junior and senior year of high school okay. to basic training and then I came back, I graduated, and then I went to my advanced individual training. In which branch of military did you serve and what war did you serve? I served in the Illinois Army National Guard and the Illinois Indiana Army National Guard. Um, I deployed in 2005 and 2006 in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Why did you choose that specific branch of military? Um, for me at the time, I just wanted to go to college. I wanted to stay close to the family and friends that I had. And when I spoke to the recruiter, they told me that I could go to college and stay here. So that's what I did. So you went to basic training, but you still were able to see your family and stuff? Well, you're at basic training for nine weeks. So I went down to Fort Jackson in South Carolina. Oh my goodness, that's horrible. And um, I was there for nine weeks, and then I came home. I did my senior year of high school, and then I graduated. And then I went back down to Savannah, Georgia for my advanced individual training. Did that, came home, and then we were alerted that we would be deployed soon. Oh, cool. Um, did you, so you, didn't, you said you were in the military for like 13 years. Did you think that you were going to be in the military that long, or did you, did you just stop planning that? I don't think I had a plan. I really don't. I didn't I didn't know if I'd be there for just the first term or if I would just keep re-upping and staying. I don't think I ever thought that I'd be here for 13 years, but I did. I stayed. Did you recall your do you recall your first 
first days of service. Yeah. Um, when I came back from basic training, I remember falling asleep in the bathroom at school because I was so tired. After nine weeks of sleep deprivation and <laughs> running and doing things that I never dreamed that I would, you know, um, throwing the grenades and marching 14 miles and I don't know, just things I just never saw myself doing. I got back to school and I was falling asleep in class, which I didn't like to do. So I got up and excused myself to go to the bathroom and I fell asleep in the stall <laughs> and slept for maybe 15 to 30 minutes. <laughs> Nobody ever knew, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was your training difficult? It, if so, how? Um, parts of it was. Um, I wasn't huge into athletics. So when we first got to basic training, uh, the running was the hardest part for me, but I refused to fall back or fall out or take a break. I just stayed with it. Um, I remember my grandparents telling me that they didn't think that I would make it because of all the running involved, but I did. Um, and, and that was good for me. Um, I ended up getting a stress fracture in my right foot and uh, they almost sent me home and I didn't want to go home, so I begged and begged to stay and they let me stay. And so I did our last and final march, which is 12 to 14 miles on a stress fracture. So that, that part hurt? was hard for me. Yeah, it <laughs> didn't feel good, but my foot's fine now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, how did your experience in basic training change you? I think for service members, we can point each other out, even if we aren't in uniform, even if the guys don't have the haircuts, because when we walk, we walk in step. We're marching oh, almost, so cool. you know. So it's just a, a natural thing that you do. You know, you're in step with the person that you're walking with. Um, I think that was a big difference too, because I had more respect for my appearance. Um, for females in the military, you can't have unnatural hair color. You, you can only have fingernails a certain length. You can't have color on your fingernails. Um, the tattoos and the piercings were really limited because we had regulations against that. Um, I think I had a lot more respect for my dad and my grandpa and the way they were in their household because it was really structured and being in the military myself, I now knew where that came from. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> Do you recall your, inst your instructors? If so, what were they like? I remember Drill Sergeant Keen because he was really funny. I remember Drill Sergeant Bell because he was just crazy. He was always jumping around and screaming and yelling and trying to motivate us. Did that um, scare you, all that yelling? Um, it didn't, it didn't. I grew up with my dad who was like in a very strict environment, so I was used to it, you know. Um, they weren't scary, I mean they can't touch you or do anything, so it was just, you didn't want to laugh because you get in trouble for that too, but you know. <laughs> Uh, we had Drill Sergeant Wasu, which is really funny because I ended up running into him when I was flying home from Iraq on leave. And I approached him and I said, I remember you from basic training. And he asked me if I was one of his. And I said, no. He asked me if I was Bulldog, which I had been. And he started yelling and told me to get away from him. Playing, joking, of course. But it was neat. <laughs> That's great. Um, what did you do after basic training? I came back to high school and finished my senior year. Uh, did you re receive any specialized training? So what? Um, I mean, we have our advanced individual training that we go for our MOS uh, for 25 Lima. Then, so I had to go back down to Georgia, and um, it's where you learn how to run the cables for the phone lines and such. So we had to go through that, and that was seven weeks. Because you were in tech, right? Did you say that you were in tech? Or? Yeah, it's a cable installer okay. maintainer. That's cool. What was your position in the military or job? Signal Corps. So um, my first MOS was 25 Lima and then my second MOS was 25 Uniform. Both were, one was cables maintaining and installing and the other one was a radio specialist. Okay. Is that, do you like that? No. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> what did you not like about it? I'm not a very tech savvy person you know I can operate my computer like anybody else can I'm sure but when it comes into 
programming and that sort of thing is just not my forte. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that too, so. I like yeah. plug and play, push a button. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. So how many, w were there any other women in your division? Yeah. Yep, we were a co-ed unit. Um, it's actually the one right here in Carbondale that they just recently moved out to the Murfreesboro. We were a co-ed unit, so. Well, did you face any unique challenges as being a woman in the military? Or like, did you feel like I think being a woman in any profession, you know, where I don't want to say you're competing with a man, but you're working with a man, there's always going to be that challenge of because you're a woman, they think that, you know, maybe you can't handle it or you're not strong enough or maybe somebody else could do it better. Um, not because it's in a negative connotation, it's just the way that we've evolved as a society, I think. Yeah. You know, I don't ever feel like I was looked down upon or anything like that, but you know, lifting heavy things and having guys run over and get it and stuff like that, you know, I can handle it too. I can do it. It's my equipment and I can take care of it. <laughs> did, did you feel supported by your comrades, fellow comrades? Is that what you when I deployed, absolutely. Um, deploying when Alpha Company 133rd, 2nd Battalion, I absolutely felt like they were family. Yeah. So, yeah. we were really close. That's great. How did you adapt to military life? Like the food and stuff and brackets and oh the food's horrible <laughs> it tastes horrible um, you know I know some people talk about how good the food is in some places and it's true um, while we are overseas you know the cooks were doing the best that they could but you know they're not real eggs they're not real potatoes and the, the good chow halls and stuff that you looked for is because they had a lot of seasoning or they had different things that we didn't have uh, the food isn't great. I don't know who started that rumor. Where did you serve? And how did you mentally prepare yourself to go overseas? I s we went to Baghdad, Iraq. Um, I graduated high school. And then I went to training. And then I came back and we were alerted that we would be being deployed soon. In December of uh, 2005. No, 2004. I received a phone call from what would become my commander for the deployment telling me that uh, we needed to report to Chicago on January 5th, 2005. Um, I don't know, I was just really shocked. You know, we knew it was coming, but I don't know. We were 19, most of us, and so I didn't know what to do. Um, they had us fill out our wills, power of attorneys. Mm -hmm things that you like you never think about at 19 um, so that was shocking and so mentally preparing some of us kept thinking that maybe we wouldn't go because you know we'd watch other deployments get canceled and everything else and because we were guard and when you join the guard it was always in our head that you know we would stay here stateside um, and that was a lot of questions my family had too uh, so a lot of it was just telling our family that it'd be okay and that uh, we would be stateside for six months in Georgia. Okay. Were you scared? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. We were all scared. When you did go overseas, did you miss home? Like, of course you did, but how did you keep in contact with your family? Well, you know, it's funny, like when we deployed, Facebook wasn't a thing yet. MySpace was the big thing, um, but I wasn't really up to date on it. I had a MySpace page, but it wasn't like Facebook now, you know, where you can message and stuff like that. Um, I wrote a lot of letters, and I actually still have them. People who sent me letters and wrote back and forth. I got a track phone while I was over there um, that I brought bought from Iraqi National and uh, used it to call home every once in a while, but it was really expensive. We had MWR tents where we could take prepaid phone car cards and call back home. Um, there was a number that we could call that sent us to Scott Air Force Base and they would dial the number to our loved ones for us so we could talk that way for free. Um, care packages. Family sent a lot of care packages with just beef jerky, favorite foods, and that sort of thing. Cool. That's really cool. How did that influence your time overseas, like being away from your family? Um, I was never super close with my family, so being away, I don't want to say it wasn't hard, but you know, you missed them because like within a year you do spend a lot of time with your family for different holidays and birthdays. 
um, while I was there, I was surrounded by people I was serving with, and they became family. And so it was easy, you know, to not forget, but still be okay. It was the major holidays, like Thanksgiving and Christmas, that, you know, everybody would just kind of sit around and think, wow, we're here. Yeah. We're not at home. What do we do now? Yeah. So, and how long were you away? How long <coughs> were you in Iraq? We were in Iraq a little under a year. And in Baghdad the whole time? Correct. We, um, there were some of us that stayed at the same camp throughout the, throughout our deployment. The group that I was with, we were at Camp Striker, and then we moved to Camp Prosperity, and then we ended our deployment at Camp Liberty. Do you remember arriving overseas? What was your thoughts about that? Yeah. It was a really long flight. I remember there being a lot of layovers, a lot of waiting, a lot of sleeping. Um, when we did finally hit ground, I remember riding on a bus. I remember it being really dark. I remember finally stopping out of the bus and it was just so hot. <laughs> and the sand just like hitting you and I mean the whole time we were over there there wasn't a day that you were ever clean you know maybe like the first few seconds after you got out of the shower but as soon as you walk outside that sand is all over you oh. so. so what friends did you make in the military and what did you do for fun um i think i became friends with a group of people that i never would have been friends with before and i mean that in the most loving way possible um like i told you before i'm not very tech savvy um, I'm not into a lot of sci-fi things or anything like that. And I made friends with a group of people who were major nerds. I mean, uh, into the computers, into, you know, Comic-Con and magic, the magic cards and Pokemon and all of that. And, uh, they are hilarious and they're, we're still really good friends. Um, you know, and everybody's gotten married and has kids and, you know, we've been able to watch each other you know, move up in rank in the military, but also grow in our personal lives. And so, you know, they're still, we're still really close. And it means a lot to me. Yeah. So what did you do for us? Overseas? Yeah. Um, there was a lot of pranks. Uh -huh. I, I think that uh, most people would think so too. Um, people would dress up in certain parts of their uniform, you know, that covered their faces and go scare people, um, roll them out of their cots. Uh, there was a lot of pranks involving baby powder, you know, hitting people with baby powder, um, hiding their stuff, whatever they're looking for, putting stuff in their tent that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, they were just a fun group of people. For whatever reason, we had, we were highly entertained to take people together and two things. I don't know why, that's just what we did. <laughs> what was the funniest prank, if you have one? Um, we taped our friend Harlow to a flagpole once, uh -huh. and so he had to walk around with it on his back until somebody cut him loose, and we were pretty entertained by that. Did you see combat? That's, that's the only question I asked. Uh, no. Okay. No, I didn't. I was um, in what they consider a green zone, or inside the wire, as we call it, you know, a safe zone. Um, the only time I left that was to travel to and from. Um, I worked at a prison for a little bit, and when we need to go release prisoners, we would go outside the wire very, very little. Um, I was never involved in combat. When you were in Iraq, what, where, where did you live? Did you live in a tent or? <laughs> yeah, um, for like the first six months or so that I was there, I lived in a tent. Um, we had skylights, holes in the tents in the top. Um, we had air conditioners that worked sometimes. Um, we had shower tents. Um, there are others that were lucky enough to be on other camps that had trailers to live in and we were always jealous so But when we moved to Camp Prosperity, we were in trailers as well. It was much nicer than the tents The tents were crammed because we had so many people in it at once and like I said the air conditioning didn't work And our skylights were very lovely <laughs> So what was the landscape like? Just sand just sand everywhere. Um, the palace is over there, you know, we got to visit and see their, they were beautiful. Marble, gold, the murals on the walls that are carved into the, the marble and everything. Um, very elaborate. So I mean, that was, 
That's what it all looked like to us, just sand and sporadic palaces. Was it like hot? Yeah, I mean, everything was just hot there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even at night it was hot. Yeah, um. I, I understand. I can't, I can't imagine, but I, I can't. <laughs> Did you see any civilians doing any around there? Yeah, um, while we were overseas, they had nationals that would come on our camps and do jobs that they were paid for. Um, we had Iraqis that would come in and cook in our tow halls, and you know they were paid by the military to do so, um, to do cleanup, just odd jobs on the camp. Um, and then our soldiers would escort them around to make sure that they weren't trying to plan anything negative against us. Did you have to communicate with any, any of them? Like, I tried once. Um, I learned very little Arabic while I was there, just enough to get by. Especially when I worked in the prison, you know, we learned like my is water, uh, M she is walk, uh, just to communicate with them that way. But we always had interpreters if we needed to have a, a longer conversation. But describe an, a really good day really good day. Everybody showed up on time. Everybody was in uniform. First sergeant was in a good mood. And we got to go home early. <laughs> um, can you tell me about like a terrible day? Not like with casualties or anything, but just like not a very good day, you know? Not a very good day. People show up late and they're not in uniform, no haircuts, and your first sergeant's mad. Commander can't be found and somebody's duct taped to the flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, what was your favorite food there? My favorite food? Yeah. There was a lemon poppy seed cake in the MRE that I really liked. Um, stateside, our cooks had a little bit more access to better food, so lunch was usually better. But, yeah, the lemon poppy seed cake is probably my favorite. <laughs> did you eat, like when you were in Iraq, did you eat the local food or the water soda? Yes, and it was wonderful. Um, what was it, baklava and the chai tea. I still drink chai tea to this day. Um, one of our interpreters used to make it for me every night and I loved it. And uh, I, I still okay. make it at home. Yeah. Was your armor and equipment up to date or were they from a previous era? Some of it was up to date. Um, our vehicles that left our safe zone, I would say most of them were up armored. Since I didn't leave the safe zone, I'm not 100% sure. But what I saw was up armored. Um, but we did have some vehicles that were not, but they were used primarily for transportation within camps um, to move heavy equipment or a lot of soldiers from one place to another. Okay. Um, did you have to wear a helmet? Because there's a question about helmets, but did you wear any helmet? Yeah, we wore helmets. Um, like I said, since I was Signal Corps, we spent a lot of our time on the camps, and so we didn't go outside. Um, so there were certain days where they felt, for whatever reason, that we might be attacked, that we would be in what they call full battle rattle, which is your helmet, your vest, and your weapon with you. Um, but we had the newer helmets that had the good padding and stuff, so they were more comfortable than the older styles. Was it a Kelvar helmet or a steel pot or either of those? Is it Kevlar? Mm -hmm. Kevlar. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, what was like? What, what like was your daily jobs? What did you have to do? Um, when we first got into country, we had to um, set up and establish our connections. But once everything was set up, we just had to monitor everything. And if our signal went down or if a connection was lost, then we worked to get it back in place. And did those those tech friends did those help with that? Yes, they did. <laughs> they were great. Um, I wasn't very helpful with it, you know. At the time, I just did the twenty five Lima stuff. So if they needed a cable or a wire run, I was your girl. But if it got too complicated, I needed somebody else. Um, did you have any experience with IEDs, Ex improvised explosive devices? I didn't have any personal experiences. Um, we had some of our soldiers from our own company that. They were convoying to another place and an IED went off and, you know, they reacted the best they could. Um, 
while we were supporting 48th Brigade, I became really good friends with uh, 2121 Infantry. And fortunately, uh, a group of guys, two different groups, had came in really close contact with it and they were killed. Do you have an interpreter inside your unit? And did it look, yeah. We didn't have one within our unit that I'm aware of. Um, when I worked at the, the prison, we had one there. We had two. Uh, we called them Thunder and AK, which was not the real names, but we weren't allowed to say them for, you know, security reasons, for their safety. How many units were you attached to? Oh my goodness, several. <laughs> Three or four at, at a time, but um, it was just a matter of units that came into country that we would support, and depending on what area we were, we were in, our entire company was supporting different ones. Did your, was your tour ever extended? No, I remember the last uh, four, three or four months that we were there that there was a whisper that somebody was saying that we might be extended, but it never happened. Okay. Um, what were the requirements for the promotions you received? Did, what were the requirements for the promotions you received? And did this come easy for you? Um, for promotions, you had to pass your APFT, which is the two mile run, the two minute of push ups and set ups. Um, you couldn't be flagged for anything. Uh, you had to be in good standing, actively drilling. You couldn't be AWOL, obviously. You had to be there to get it. <laughs> um, and then, d depending on the rank, there were different classes that you had to take or different courses you had to go through and pass. So, um, they were easy. Um, were you given any, uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, and I couldn't name them for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Do you remember who gave them to you? And was there a ceremony? Um, I remember that I, I we all were awarded medals from deployment and they came from our section sergeants and our commander. Um, throughout my service I've had some from my first sergeant and platoon sergeants. Um, was downtime limited because there were more work than soldiers? Mm, overseas, yes. Stateside, no, I would say that our downtime was always there. Now, when we got clutches, you said you were a drill sergeant, is that correct? No, I was not a drill sergeant. Okay. Um, I was a cadre member in a recruitment sustainment program. Um, we had drill sergeants that would come in, but we acted as drill sergeants, just meaning we yelled a lot, instructed uh, new recruits on what to do, what not to do, how to address rank, and how to march, and teach them just basic military things. Now, like, we have this stereotype version of, like, a a drill sergeant be real mean and stuff because of the military, like, is that accurate? Yes. Or, or no? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't find myself to be very scary, but once I left the unit, I did have some of the soldiers reach out to me and they told me that they were afraid of me and it made me laugh. They said <laughs> I was really loud, but, you know, when you're yelling, you don't really hear yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what <laughs> yeah. um, When times were difficult, what motivated you? While we were deployed, uh, I think my friends motivated me the most. Um, the support that I had there, um, just wanting to get home and to be safe again. Um, after deployment and after we had our personal lives back, my daughter has been a huge motivation for me. What convictions did you have that helped you? Did you have any convictions that helped you during your time in service? I don't, I don't know. Honestly, um, I think just the way that I was raised, you know, it was a very strict environment. I think that was beneficial to me, opposed to somebody who had a relaxed home to grow up in. Um, it was easy for me to follow directions and do it right the first time, and <laughs> the yelling didn't scare me or bother me. I just felt that it was just the way people talked. Yeah. What What was your main form of contact with family and friends? And, and you said you spent a lot of letters, so... Yeah, um, I would say that the letters were probably the most time that I spent on. Um, 
the phones, sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. Um, we had blackout periods while we were overseas. If somebody had been killed, then the phones and everything were killed so that the chain of command had a chance to contact the family and tell them appropriately versus some random person contacting a soldier's family and saying, hey, you know, he's dead, she's dead, whatever. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said you sent a lot of letters and sent them to your teacher. Do you, have you ever thought about, like, putting it into a book or something? Yeah, I've been asked that a lot, actually. Um, Mrs. Carondo, she's amazing. Um, she's retired now. Um, but she started it. She started all the journaling. Before I left her basic training, she gave me a journal, and she said, just write whatever you want. And I did. And then I had it, and I didn't know what else to do with it, so I gave it back to her. And so then when I went to AIT, I did the same thing. I took a journal with me, I gave it back to her. So when I deployed, it just felt like the natural thing to do. And I think it was three journals that I filled while I was gone and gave them back to her. And since she's a teacher, you know, she has a red pen and her writing's in it as well, where she's commented on stuff that I'd written about. She probably corrected a lot of the things for me, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've I've tried to write before. Um, I just get extreme writer's block, and I just can't. I don't know. You know, it's I interesting just, I, to you, but to me, you know, I was just there. It was just life. It was just normal. So you know, when you think about your life, you think everybody's life is like that. So you don't find it that interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how was having the ability to contact home helpful? I think it was good just to stay grounded. Um, I think that when you're in an environment for so long, you think that's normal. You know what I mean? So it was good to call home and friends talk about a new TV show or a popular song or, you know, what they were doing, whether it was bonfires or working and, and realizing that, you know, you were going to go back there and that would be your life again. How are today's wars different? I'm sorry? How, how are today's wars different? Um, like I said before, my, my dad never really talked about his service before I left. Um, and he only said one very quick, short thing to me. So I would think that our wars, because of social media, because of electronics, um, so much more of it is seen by civilians. Um, The things that my grandfather and my dad went through, I'll never see because there's not a recording of it. Yeah. But, you know, like when my daughter's older, she could get on YouTube and see Iraq. She could look at pictures that I have and see Iraq um, to find a photo of my dad in his uniform or my grandpa in his uniform is a really rare thing. Yeah. You know, so I think that's one of the biggest differences. And coming home and having the support that we have from civilians is much different than what my dad and grandfather experienced themselves. Yeah. How can civilians be more aware and for, informed? I mean, they, they know. I mean, they see the war and stuff like that. I think, I think my own personal opinion on it is that soldiers, we don't want pity. We don't want sympathy for those that struggle with PTSD or anything else. They just want to be understood. You know, we're not dangerous. Yeah. We're not here to hurt anybody. We're just trying to deal like everybody else is. Yeah. So do you recall the day your service ended? I do, yeah. I got out in May 16, 2016 of this year, so. Um, my last day, I actually donned a beret on one of my soldiers that graduated uh, his basic training in AIT. So that was exciting for me because... I had taught him through the RSP program and watched him go on and graduate, and so that was a proud moment for me, and I was excited to do it. Um, how did you handle switching your mindset when it was time to come home? I think that's one of the great things about being in the Guard, is that we always maintain that civilian life, and then we have our military bearing. So when I was ready to leave the Guard and I made that decision, going home was just like every other drill weekend. The only difference now is that I don't have that one week in a month that I have to plan everything around, you know, that I'm going to be gone. I get to be 
wherever I want to be. I don't have the two weeks in the summer, you know, that we have to plan vacations around. I'm just, I'm just here. And this past summer, I just did absolutely nothing. I did all kinds of things that I kept saying I'll do when I have time. You know, we painted, we did crafts, we went to Holiday World, we went to the zoo, you know, just life. Yeah, that's great. Um, how were you received by your family and community? Um, when I came home from Baghdad, uh, my dad actually contacted the town that I was raised in, in Willsville, Illinois, and uh, the town had a, a fish fry for me, oh, and uh, the town presented a plaque uh, to me, just thanking me for my service. You know, any business that had a sign that had my name on it, welcoming me home. So, it was nice. It was great to see everybody. I got to see a lot of people that I hadn't seen for years, even prior to my deployment. How has your mindset changed since you've been in the military? Um, <laughs> I think just mm, things that, I, I don't know, I guess like the biggest thing is uh, like I'm not allowed to have unnatural hair color in the military and so changing my hair color was like a big thing for me. Um, it always been like blonde or brown, you know. Um, being able to have fingernails and have them painted, you know, without having to worry about it. Being able to wear as many rings as I want without somebody calling it out, I think that's different, so. Yeah. Um, which is everything you look at differently now that you've been in the military, or something you appreciate more now? I think I'm a lot cleaner and more organized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I pick things apart because I like things a certain way. It's almost OCD-ish. You know, I like things in a certain place. I like them folded a certain way. I, clean things differently. Were you so. not like that before? I, I was because of my dad, but um, I think when you start re-rolling socks because somebody didn't roll them the way that you wanted them done, I think there's an issue. What have you done since separa um, separating from the military? Sorry. I graduated from SIU with my bachelor's in business marketing, um, and I took a job over at Johnny Logan College as their veteran affairs specialist. So I'm their school certifying official and the advisor for veterans and their dependents. Cool. Do you use any military benefits? I use my education benefits to pay for my bachelor's degree, so I don't have any student loans. Um, I've used the VA a couple of times for like emergency room and stuff like that since there's not a charge for us. Outside of that, I plan on using their home loan, the VA home loan, um, to purchase my first home. Have you remained in contact with any, or reunited with any of your fellow veterans? Oh yeah. We still talk, you know, it's sporadic, everybody's busy, but when we get together it's like, you know, a day hasn't passed, but, you know, they're always going to be really good friends. Okay. Um, are you a member of any veteran organizations? Um, not at the moment. I used to be involved in um, Team RWB here on SIU campus. Um, I used to be a member of the BFW in Marion. Um, I, just, I haven't participated in it for many, many years. Not for any reason, I just haven't had the time. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, how did military um, experience affect your life? I don't, I don't know if it affected my life so much because it was just something that I was used to. You know, I joined when I was 17 and now I'm 31 and I'm just used to it. I think it affected my family, you know, uh, my friends who were not in, it's affected my daughter, you know, um, when she was younger, not knowing why mom wasn't there, you know, on certain weekends or during certain times. Um, it was a positive thing for me to go and do. I was proud of my service and I still am. Um, I had a goal to get my college paid for and it, it took me a little while, but you know, I got there and it's done. Yeah, that's great. What are some life lessons you've learned from the military service? Um, perception is everything. Has anyone thank you for your service? Yes. Yes, I've been stopped by strangers. Um, anytime that I would wear my uniform, I was stopped by strangers all the time, which um, you just don't know what to say. You know, um, my dad never got that. My grandpa never got that. And so they've been with, well, my dad's been with me when it's happened. And it's something new for him to see, you know. Um, 
And since there was such a stigma on his, you know, the time that he served in Korea, he never got that. And I think that's probably why he didn't talk about his service. Okay. Yeah. How has your military services impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? I just try to remain neutral until I know everything. Um, I don't agree nor disagree with war. I believe there's reasons and situations for every decision to be made. And I don't think it's something that you can just lump together and say it's wrong or it's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. Did, did your time in military influence your choice of job? <laughs> You'd think so, but uh, no. Actually, the office that I took over, I worked in as a student worker while I went to college, and uh, I enjoyed working with the veterans and helping them, and, you know, nobody really told me how to use my education benefits. They just said that I would go to college for free. Um, and so as I worked there as a student worker, I, I learned how it works so I could tell other veterans and now I just get to do it full time. <laughs> what was the most positive thing you took away from your experience in the military? All the friendships, absolutely. Um, I just don't think the bond that you have with people that you deploy with will be different than any other friendship that you'll ever have. Yeah. Okay. What messages would you like to leave for future generations who want to hear this interview? You don't have to have a reason to serve. You can just do it. Um, it doesn't have to be for college. It doesn't have to be for your parents. If you want to put on a uniform and you want to see if you can do it, that's okay too. Yeah. Do you have any advice for any girls or any other youth that want to be in the military? You can do it. You know, there. The advice that I give, I would give a girl, wouldn't be any different than a guy. Yeah. Um, you're fully capable. Okay. Is there anything we feel we haven't discussed, or should be we, we should add or talk about? No. Okay. So thank you so much for doing this, and thank you so much for your service, and I'm so appreci I'm so appreciative. So. <laughs> thank you. Okay.